All right, folks, welcome to the Gritty Podcast. Today, I am joined by my good friend, Mark Livesey. Mark, how are you? Good. Glad to be back. Yeah. So Mark is uh, the llama guy, as well as the Treeline Academy uh, e-scouting, elk e-scouting, bear e-scouting, mule deer e-scouting. No, no, no. Let's not get, <laughs> let's not get carried away here yet. We're working on those, but I'm going to have partners on those. I'm... Um, I can te- I can teach people the tech behind it, but yeah. I'm going to bring in some real some heavy hitters on mule deer. Yeah. And bear. Now bears, um, I am gaining more and more and more knowledge in the, over my years of bear hunting, but mule deer, I still consider myself pretty green in the mule deer world. It's, we just finished our bear hunts yeah. together with the llamas. By the way, we should just have some podcasts on llamas themselves because it's been a while. We did do one years ago. Yeah, that very first podcast. Well, uh-huh. not the very first, but maybe it was the very first. It was the very first I think first it was the one. first one where you were like a solid guest. Yeah. Not just a voiceover. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not just welcome, <laughs> welcome to the, to the podcast. podcast. Yeah. But uh, so we did this before. For those who don't know that are just kind of tuning in for the first time, Mark has an online uh e-scouting course for elk finding elk uh and we covered your modules it's a lot of modules this is a real professional course and you can purchase the course take the classes but what we did was we touched on each module so walked through them and we got through half the modules roughly before hunting season kicked in and and uh we got on to that now we're revisiting it and there's the remaining modules that we've not talked about. And when I say module there, it's your course is split up into different sections. And for those that didn't listen to the earlier podcasts with Mark, uh, you probably want to go check those out, especially the ones that was really popular was like your elk finding features, uh, the, the benches. Intro, yeah. And, the, you know, the, so like you said, what we're trying to do here is look at, instead of just getting on the pockets and just, start spewing random e-scouting stuff. Yep. Um, what I find, even in my course, that hunters, they don't want to know that, oh, yeah, fires. You know, elk really, they love fire areas. They just love them. <laughs> right. Well, I they do. Yeah. What do they love about them? How do they come and go from the fire areas? How old do they tend to, how old do you want to tend for them to be? How do you know how, how old the fire is? How hot did it burn? How devastating? What time of year did it start? Yeah. What time of year did it finish burning? These are all things that have a big play. Are they on steep slopes? Steeper slope fires don't regenerate as quick as um, low less, land. You look not low land, flat land, flatter land to hold moisture. I mean, there's a lot of factors mm-hmm. here, and so breaking it down and that level of detail, I've just I've been surprised at. That's the way I like to do things. I like to know all the ins and outs. It's just my personality and. When I started doing this course, when I started recording all these hours and hours of, I'm like, man, I don't know mm-hmm. if this is going to be too much. People are going to be yeah, bored, whatever. But it's like I can't put enough in. Because most hunters I'm running into that are really trying to up their game, they want the details. And they want all the information. So what we're trying to do, or what we've been trying to do, is go module by module so that we can stay focused on that particular topic, whatever it happens to be. Well, as you start to peel back the onion, we started to realize there was <clears throat> just so much content to cover. And of course we want it. We recommend everyone take the course that, and, but for those that aren't sure if they want to do that, you can listen to the podcast, get those details. You're going to take something away from this regardless. Yeah. And, yeah. and then uh, maybe that, that encourages you to take that next step because I, I've i said this over and over again, say it again, nobody that is out there will go wrong taking the course. It's worth every penny. Well, and I don't, like you said, I appreciate what you just said, but I, I don't really, I'd love for you to take it, okay? Um, I put a lot of work into it. I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I have a guarantee. If you don't, you just tell me and I take care of it. Yeah. It's that simple. No questions asked. And, um, but if you don't or can't afford, I don't want anyone that can't afford it or whatever, not on my, on my website at treelinepursuits.com. I've got every podcast I've ever done, including all the ones that we've done listed in order. So even if you do that, 
you're going to get a lot of information. There's almost 50 podcasts yeah. on there. The ones we're getting ready to start up here. Yeah. Guys, these will give you some starts. So, you know, and if that's as far as you want to take it, yep, I get it. But um, I hope what you'll see is that um, we spend so much money on elk hunting. We spend so much money on gear. I mean, I'm included, guys. I just bought a new bow. I'm getting new boots. I mean, just <laughs> the money I spend to chase these critters. But we just don't invest much in our education. Yeah. And what what if you think about mountain climbing, you think about um, skiing, you think about all the things that we do as a recreational, we tend to invest in getting better. We take lessons. We do things. But hunting is one area that I don't see a lot of guys that put a lot of investment into furthering their education. Even if you think you know a lot about finding elk and where elk like to be i think there's going to be a lot of technical aspects of the course Mm -hmm. that's going to how to use google earth to your maximum ability how to use the different hunt platforms how to really look at um some very unique and very um non-obvious features of some of these things so it's not all about just finding elk it's about using your technology to its maximum, both before the hunt and in the field. Yeah. So there's a lot of angles um, that we try to get into. But um, today, I think we're going to the next one on the list is canyons, creeks, and drainages. And um, there's a lot there. I, this is one of my favorite modules um, because I, when I do my personal e-scouting, mm-hmm. fires is probably the one I spend the most time on if I'm hunting an area that has a, a fire, recent fire. But the drainage analysis I think is something that is probably the most important thing because it's kind of the, one of the key factors of, of where you're going to hunt elk, mm-hmm. you know, you know, what drainage you're going to go into, what basin you're going to focus on, um, the ridges, the ridge lines and micro ridge lines that contribute to those basins. Those are all kind of really key, um, when it comes to finding core hunt areas and kind of, uh, figuring out where you're going to focus your attention on, you know, when you're on a hunt. So I think this module, um, is right up there as one of the top mo- top modules in the course. So yeah, I re- I would agree. So tell me about it, Mark. Um, so the way in the course, I was just looking through my notes here to refresh my memory. Um, like the Meadows module, I have ten rules uh, or ten principles um, when it comes to um, drainages that I covered. So I thought we just kind of run through, kind of briefly talk about them. Obviously, we go into a lot more details, but. Um, The orientation of the drainage is one of the first things that I tend to want to look at is what directions they predominantly face, what north face exposure those drainages offer. Now, keep in mind that one of my favorite, you know, basins or spoons or drainages, if you want to call it that, if you think about, you know, topography, when you've got a creek drainage or or whatever it is, um, a canyon, Mm -hmm. I if I can, you know, it doesn't always lay out this way, but I really like the north facing spoon drainages where the entire canyon faces to the north and the back of the canyon has got a north, northwesterly, northeasterly facing drainage. But that's not exclusively, you know, that's not exclusive. It's just that when I see those, I, I tend to get excited about those. Um, but I also like to look at drainages and canyons that have just, that run east and west that have northerly facing slopes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A lot of guys are going to get all worked up. I know about this north facing slope guys. Here's the deal. I've said this a million times. Do elk live on the south facing slopes? Of course they do. Do they live on the east and west? Of course they do. But during archery season, during the rut, during warmer periods of time, during low, during like drought periods, like we got right now in a lot of the west, I find that elk tend to be on the northerly sides more than they tend to be on other slopes. That does not mean exclusive. Everybody gets worked up when I say north slopes. Yeah. It's just one factor, guys. It's one elk finding feature. It's not the only one, and it certainly isn't the most important one. It's just I've it's an odds thing. We talk about this all the time. When I look at elk hunting, I think of it as odds multiplication, meaning I want to stack as many odds in my favor as possible. When I go into an area, I want to have the best odds that I can generate that there's going to be elk there. Right, right. And north-facing slopes that have got some of these other components um, that we'll talk about are odds multipliers to me. Right. 
And I don't know, I mean, what you think about the slopes, but I, I tend to focus on those more than I focus on south slopes during archery season. Now, late season rifle, that's that's a whole other ballgame. And, you know, we, there's a module for that. We talk about that too. But archery season during the rut, usually, you know, warmer periods or just starting the weather starting to turn, I find that the vegetation, the weather, the wind predictability, just the general temperature, um, the the – Thermocline, everything is better on yeah. those northerly facing slopes. Yeah, I would agree. Absolutely, 100%. Because a lot of times that's the last place where that snow was. That's where the, the green up is, is the, the best. That's where it doesn't get scorched by the sun in June and July, uh, August. And so you're getting, you, you have the right kind of uh, habitat that they're going to gravitate to mostly. It's not a hard and fast rule, like you're saying. It's not like, oh, North Face, there they are. You know, they could be wherever. There's a lot of other factors that at play for vegetation, for right. cover, for then just which side is North Facing, South Facing. But in general, yeah, I agree with you 100% that, that during that time of year, that's, that's where it's at. Yeah, so I, that's just that's one of the rules, you know, is that northerly. I'm looking for those canyons and drainages and basins that have that northerly presentation of some mm-hmm. kind. Um, it can be small, and sometimes the smaller the better. If a, if a drainage has an, an enormous amount of northern exposure, they could sometimes be they're harder to find. Yeah, guys get caught up on that. Sometimes you got to be careful what you look for. Is it can be too much of a good thing. Yeah. And uh, so I'm not saying, you know, I, I'm just saying that it's it's a factor. To me, that's where you're hunting. Um, sometimes I've learned this over the years. I hunt a spot more than I do the animal. Yeah. Because like you said, let's say you go into a, a, a canyon drainage basin and, and it's north facing. Like the whole thing is just all north. And it's just, they could be anywhere on there because it's all great. You go into the, another basin a little bit further down and there's only like two pockets. So if the elk are there, that's where they're going to be. Yeah. I, I tend to go for the area where I'm going to, where, where they're more isolated, where I'm going to be able to locate them. It's like bear season. When, when I'm in an area where the, it's just barely green and up, like, like the only green spot, there's three green spots in the entire uh, five mile radius. Cause nothing else has got, has got the sun on it yet. Give it another week and everything turns green. Right. Give, give it another week and everything's overgrown. But in that particular window, I know that if I hit that timing window, the, the bears that are there are going to be concentrated in these tiny spots. So I, I kind of like, like what you're saying, yeah. finding the areas where, you know, there's a few where the pockets kind of are, uh, where you don't have too much of a good thing. And so you have, you can, isolate your the, those animals you can find them a little easier and hunt the spot a little easier so when you have these areas let's say like you just said when you have an area that has too much of a good thing mm-hmm. i'm gonna be like it's guys it's this simple it's a check it's like perfect we got big north facing bulls that's one odds multiplier okay yep great okay. that's great but that's now not what? the end all yeah so now i start looking at okay what other elk finding features does it have So this is where, you know, I'm going to get off a little bit of rabbit hole here, but I talk about this earlier in the course, but guys, this is really important. When you're doing e-scouting, when you're setting it your computer and you're dropping waypoints and you're marking points of interest and you're marking these features, it is imperative, I feel, that you develop a custom mark, I call it a custom markup language um, that works for you, that you try to mark... um, things with similar with the same icon set so to speak Mm -hmm. because when i first started and i know some guys are going to smile when i say this is your screen if you're using on x your screen is covered with red on x dots yeah and you're looking at that and it's a sea of red (laughs) and you're like what does that mean you know but if you start color coding and you start using a legend i have my legend right beside my computer i don't have to reference it much anymore but um you know, you've marked benches with a certain icon or a color. Yep. It doesn't matter what you do as long as you understand it. Yep. 
Yeah. Now there's some things that I would recommend. Um, and I talk about them in the course on, on a, some strategies of that, but really ultimately it's just a system because when you're marking all those features, what you're going to want to see is what starts ringing the bells is when you're seeing multiple of these features. And when it's just a sea of red, sometimes it's harder to, to identify. So anyway, I just want to throw that in. Yep. So one of the other things on the list of Canyon creeks and drainage is that I get a lot of questions about is I look for drainages that do not have established trails in the bottom. Guys, what I mean by that is when you look at the USGS topographic map, does it have a dotted trail in the bottom? Most do. You'll notice a lot of canyons have trails in the bottom, um, but there's some that don't. Now, you got to be careful about this because depending on what you're using, this is where, you know, I know I preach this a lot, but I'm going to say it a million times is, you know, I'm a big fan of Onyx. I'm a big fan of Gaia. I'm a, I'm a little, I'm becoming a fan of base map for certain things. I like go hunt for a few things, guys. I am not in the cult Mm -hmm. of one application over another. I I think it's like backpacks. I mean, guys get, I only wear this backpack. I'm like, how about you just use the right tool for the job? If your bow is, is great. If it's a Hoyt and Matthews, whatever it is, doesn't matter as long as it works for you and it's accurate and you you can use it effectively and efficiently. Guys, it's the same thing here. I think of a toolbox. When I go on certain hunts, I'm using Onyx as my primary hunt application in the field. When I'm on other hunts, I'm using Gaia. Depending on the what type of hunt I'm on, mm-hmm. what type of access to certain data that I need. The reason I say that is because topographic maps are not all created equal. So I like to tell people to use multiple platforms because here's this example. When you look at a USGS scanned topographic image like Gaia has, it's going to have a certain number of trails and road and features on it. When you look at a you when you look at a US forest map topo, it's going to have different data. So what I'm saying is you might look at a drainage in one of the hunt applications and there's no trail in the bottom. But when you look at Gaia and you look at the raw scanned USG, there's a trail in the bottom. So looking at multiples can pay off. Yeah. Not just, the, oh, there's no trail. Well, let's verify. Absolutely. Trust, but verify, you know, yeah. kind of thing. So anyway, I like to find drainages that don't have these established trails running in the bottom. Um, because I know that people, hunters like to take the path of least resistance. <laughs> right. They just do. Mm-hmm. And um, like, for example, on our bear hunt, we hiked back into this really far. Yep. But we used the trail. Well, it's kind of a trail. It was a better trail yeah. when we came out than <laughs> right. when we went. But what did we do when we got there? We went into drainages that did not have trails in the bottom. Yes. We cross country a mile or two in. Guys, just that subtle difference made the difference where we were seeing a drainage that had what six seven bears in it right versus one that's right on i'm not saying you can't kill one or you can't kill elk in drainages where there's trails in the bottom i'm just saying it's another odds multiplier so we have yet to kill one where the trail is so that's my point (laughs) but you go out back there and all of a sudden there's six or seven in one little drainage so a lot of guys will go into okay for example give you another example i mean i like to give a few examples you got this big drainage and it's just real prominent and there's a trail on the bottom you've looked at it you've you've zoomed in on it you can see the trail really obvious in google earth you can actually see where it branches off a little here and there what that tells me is that there's outfitters going in. there's horses using that trail okay great well you walk in that trail and you hunt in And you hunt out and you see nothing or you don't experience, you don't find what you're looking for. Well, you've got all these micro drainages that are coming off of this main. Guys, there can be a whole new world of elk hunting on these micro drainages that are off of the main drains like we were just talking about. So Mm -hmm. using the trail as a, quote, highway to get to where you're going um, is nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying hiking in every time off trail. That's not what I do. But I do look where I'm going to actually focus my attention on is going to be once I use this trail as my transportation mode, then I'm going to be looking for a little more trailless micro drains. Like you said, the smaller footprint areas. Um, and that doesn't mean you're not going to find elk where the drainages are, but it's just one other, when I can find a place and I could check that off the list. Yeah. Um, we, I, sh- you know, I agree. I, I like we that. should uh, preface or, or kind of throw in some backstory too. If you go back to some of the first podcasts that we do in this kind of series where you you've come on here to go through the modules. One of the first things 
that you teach people within that module is within the, the course is how do you get, how do you identify the areas to even start with? That's right. And it has to do with pressure access mm -hmm. human. Uh, when the hunting season comes, uh, comes on and everybody shows up and the whole, everybody goes out there. Where are the areas that the elk are going to get pushed out of the very first? And when they do get pushed out, where are they going to move to? So you're looking for areas of high concentration of hunters, and then you're trying to find areas that are X many miles from roads, X many miles from trails, X many miles. Like, where are those places that elk are naturally going to go because it's a little bit tougher for a hunter to get there? Yep. Then you can start looking at the elk finding features within those That's right. subsets. That's right. Let's right? not jump ahead here. That's right. And so what we're talking about now is that's kind of that's a, a, work's a already given been done. that that's work's been, been done. done. Right. And right now we're looking at these drainages now. Okay. Now that we kind of already have done that we're in areas where, cause I was thinking about this earlier when you were talking at the outset of the show, you're like, I'm looking for this and I'm looking for that and everything. It's like, that's all fine and dandy. But if all of that's right there, the, the best habitat on the planet it's right there and all the elk want to be there. That's all great and dandy until there's a trailhead right that's there right, that's right. and 50 guys go in. Right. It doesn't matter how good the, the topo is and how good the habitat is or any of that if there's pressure that makes them leave. So we're that's kind of a given if you've if you followed before, you right. kind of got the strategies there. I'm glad you brought that up. And now we're like, okay, let's assume all that's been taken care of. Now we're in a drainage. What are we looking for? And – the trail going up in there could be a deal breaker for you. It, it is sometimes. For example, Brian, I just found this new area. I stumbled in a new area. I'm I'm looking at it for my own personal hunt. I was just like, I got so excited about it. Um, and, and it was funny. I got pretty excited about it. I don't. <laughs> I don't. I've looked at a lot of areas. Yeah. And when I get like, go and tell my wife. I said, man, I think I found the spot. I found this drainage on this significant river. I mean, it's a freaking significant river. Drainage is over six miles long and not one trail in it, which I have not seen that very often. Mm. And I just, so I, I got so excited, but I actually called Lampers and we were talking about something else. And I said, dude, I just found this spot. And I'm telling him, he goes, is that such and such Creek? I said, yeah, that's, he goes, oh, that's one of my hunting spots. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm going to be in there this year. <laughs> He goes, I just hunted that a few years ago. And I was like, well, so, hey, at least I felt good about that spot. Yeah. That he, you know, he kind of confirmed. But my point is, do I go into canyons that have trails in them? Of course I do. Yeah. Guys, I have llamas. So I have to plan my routes in very carefully. Um, now, they, they're really great off trail, as you saw on yeah. the bear hunt. But if I'm going 10 miles, I'd prefer not to do 10 miles of deadfall like we did. Uh, <laughs> but if you have to, you have to. But um, – I'm looking for ways to get in, but what I'm looking for is once I get back there um, into an area that I've got multiple options and multiple areas that do not. But like Brian just said, I want to reiterate this looking at an elk finding feature like Canyon Creeks and Drainage. This is after we have evaluated the zones of pressure, like you talked about, where the pressure is going to come from, what the likely um, routes, uh, uh, radiuses is mm -hmm. that we're comfortable with. But one key thing that I want to say is. We've also looked at what our limitations are as a hunter. Are we backpack hunting with our dad? How many miles from the trail? So basically what we've done is we've set up the zones of pressure, but we've also set up our hunt parameters. Yeah. What we yeah. are capable of hunting. Guys, That's there's one of the best places I have ever found e-scouting is 32 miles from the freaking trail. <laughs> Right. I want to go there so bad, but yeah. I don't think I could do it with llamas because it's a, it's a, it's going to be a week mm -hmm. getting in and getting out. And it's got a giant pass in, in, a, in it. You could get snowed in, bad things could happen. Mm -hmm. So even though I love it, I know that's outside even the realm of possibly llama. Because if some weather comes in, we got to get out quick. Yeah. And llamas are, I mean, they're great, but they only go as fast as you can walk. And there is no quickness to them. I mean, yeah. they're, you know, they're one and a half to two miles an hour. Um, they're kind of like Brian Call. They're like my speed. <laughs> I like it. I so my point is you have to know what your capabilities are 
at the same time, you have to know where the pressures come from. So all that's been worked out now, and now we're concentrating on features, and that's going to be true of the next few podcasts we're going to probably do, is we, that's all been done, and now yeah. we're looking at the features. So, I agree. I think um, that's something I talk about quite a bit because I'm always encouraging people to backpack, hunt, and get remote and get, get back there where – where you have a better hunt. And I say this often, I say, okay, a lot of guys rule out areas that are excellent hunting opportunities because they're like, I, it's a long way to pack an animal out. My take for a long time, let's say you have a, let's say you have a, uh, a 10 day hunt, you know, you, you have a seven day plus your weekends and you stole like a Monday. So you got a 10 day hunt. And you're like, okay, it's going to take me a day or two to get back to where I want to be, right? Where I, where I think these elk are going to be, okay? And then when I kill an elk, it's going to take me four days to pack it out at, you know, 100 pounds per day or 85 pounds, whatever your math is, each time you do a leg out, right? So you're like, uh, I know my fitness level. I know what I could do. I know there's a trail here. So if I kill a bull, it's going to be a four-day process packing it out. So if you're on a 10 day hunt and you need four days to pack it out and you need a day or two to get back there, that means you have a four or five day hunt in the actual spot. And if you don't kill within those four or five days, you got to pop smoke and you got to leave. And then you got to hunt those other areas that are closer to the road that you, that you've already worked out. You already originally planned to hunt, right? That you've worked out. So my thing is when you do that, all of a sudden a whole new world opens up to you with a much higher degree of success in my opinion, because you're getting to an area where you're away from those zones of pressure. You're getting to an area where you're, you're going to have a much better chance of killing a bull, just way better chance of killing a bull, but you've worked out your own limitations. Like you said, so you know, like what you are capable of. You've done the math. You yeah. know what you're going to be able to. I just, I just answered an email, Brian, just yesterday. A guy was asking. I'm worried. I'm solo. You know, what's my reasonable, you know, I said, well, I don't know your person, but let me give you an example of a Wyoming hunt. I had the hunt that the last hunt I did before I got llamas, <laughs> the year before I got llamas, we killed a bull six miles back. And then the next morning we killed another bull. Well, sounded great at the time. <laughs> it sounded like a good idea at the time. Yeah. And one of my hunting parts got really bad blisters. And so ultimately we had, we had to kind of take more trips than we had planned, but Anyway, point is, solo hunting on a bull five miles back, guys, no matter how you slice it, four trips is going to be, if you're, unless you're leaving meat, because you've got your camp back here too, yep. and I don't care how light you are, I don't care how whatever you are, if you can make two trips a day, great, it doesn't matter how many trips a day, it's going four to trips. probably take you four trips, would you, if not more. Yeah. You kill a big bull with a big set of, with a rack, I mean- that's why I was saying, you know, the thing is though, Mark, I see guys that say, okay, I'm going to go, I'm coming from the East to the West and I'm going to hunt 12 days. Okay. They've got it all dialed up and they're like, but I can only pack out a bull, you know, so far. So they go out there and they spend 12 days in the rat race with everybody else. Just, just bumping into everybody else. Cause they're trying to kill something within range of the truck and closer to a trail and all that. And I think they're they they, they they waste a lot of time in a low percentage success area because of that strategy. But if they, if they looked at it from the perspective of, okay, yeah, it's going to be four or five trips. That means I need, let's say I need five days to pack it out. That means they have a seven day hunt in epic yeah. high odds Give me seven days in an area where there's bulls everywhere and it's like chaos and it's awesome. And then five days to pack out and I'm, I'm in a pretty sweet situation. And if you don't kill in the first seven days, you still have five days of doing it how you plan to do it in the first place. Well, and you know, it's funny you just said that because what you're saying is pretty subtle. Okay. I want to make sure that the people listening are paying attention. So in your hunt plan, what you're talking about here is you've got hunt plan number one is your remote spot. Okay, that's option one. 
you're going to throw all the marbles in and you're going to go in a little further, kind of push your limits, but not over your limit. But you know how many days you've got it all worked out. But then your hunt option number two is a base camp or a very close spike camp. Mm -hmm. But you've got an option already worked out, guys. We're talking about all the features are still there. All the things to find elk are there. It's just you're a little closer to pressure. Yeah. You're going to be bumping it, potentially bumping in. They may not, elk might not be as callable. They might not be a, a few things. Yep. But you've got that hunt area. You've already got it on downloaded. You've already got it ready to go. You're, it's written out on your written hunt plan if you're following my strategy. So that you can transition in one day mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. from this to this. Yep. You're not driving into town, trying to get internet, trying to download a new set of maps, laying in your tent at night going, what am I going to do tomorrow? Man, I've got to leave in five days now. Guys, the confidence in your head when you pull out of the seven mile or five mile deep and you move into the other, you, you're ready to roll. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a mission. You've got a plan. You know you're going to have some um, – you're going to be facing maybe a little more potentially more pressure. You never know. Um, but I want to point that out that you have that worked out in your head. Yeah. And that's one of the things about this course, guys. I, you know, I know we keep talking about course, 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 but here's the thing. When I talk to Brian and Ryan and these guys, they say all these things and I'm like, hold on, <laughs> let's stop and recap because it's subtle. You just like, that's what I do. That's what I do. But there's way more to it than that. Yeah. And I just want to point that out that that hunt plan you just said, is that that's a two part hunt plan right there, or possibly even a three part because you might have two close areas, you know, worked out. I tell every guy that ever goes elk hunting, make sure you always, always have a base camp option, like mm-hmm. out of a vehicle. You twist your ankle. You want, you don't want to go home early. Mm-hmm. And I mean, if you get hurt bad, great, but things happen. You get sick. You get altitude. Anything happens. You've already got your default worked out. You yes. can already make a move, and it gives you such a level of, of comfort. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's – it's, I take for granted what I know from experience all the time. And, and, and that's really me too. And, Brian, when I did the course, it took me a long time to think through every – why am I looking at this area? So, basically, how I reverse engineered this thing was I went and looked at every area I've ever hunted over the 30 years. Mm-hmm. And every place I've ever killed elk and every, I said, why was I there? Yeah. What did I like about this? And what was there? If I killed this bull here, what was in the vicinity of that bull? And things just started popping out of me. I started making notes and, and it just started coming to me that there were certain features yeah. that I kept finding where I was killing these bulls. And even more importantly, I wasn't worried, but where I was encountering elk. Yeah. Okay. Where I was encountering elk, what features were present? And canyons, creeks, and drains, guys, is a huge one. The no trails. I was killing bull, multiple bulls in these little small drainages that didn't have a trail in them. And I'm mm. like, that's interesting. Yeah. Not along the main trail. And, guys, here's one more tip on these drainages. The further you pack in, the more the trail is important. And what I mean by that is guys that pack in long ways rarely get off the trail. Okay. The further they go, yeah. the less willing they are to get away from the trail. But the closer to the, quote, camp or trucks, they are more willing to get off the trail. Yeah. I've noticed that. So it's kind of reverse logic. But keep in mind, the deeper you go, the more important it might be just – and when I say off trail, I don't mean miles, guys. I mean like a quarter of a mile mm-hmm. to a half mile basically out of earshot. Yeah. Well, can make a big difference. I've noticed that when we do hunt, let's say a trail in a drainage, and we actually are going up that tra- trail, it's like five miles in. We're running into a lot of people, or the animals aren't very dense. We get to seven miles, you know, we start to see a few animals off trail. We get to ten miles, Mark. We kind of own. Yeah, well, that's everything whole, yeah, back there. But that's ten miles, is guys is out of the realm of possibilities for 80% of the hunters. And if you're not a 10 mile hunter, don't try to be a 10 mile hunter. True. You but, know, but you know what we were this year, <laughs> like before we hooked up with you, we, we weren't very far at all up trails. No, I know. Well, like, I know, but you were like this. Yes, <laughs> for sure. I mean, I looked at the, in the videos, it was like this. So think about that. Okay. 
So that's a perfect – if you've watched the last three Bear videos, I want to point this out. They were on a pretty used – dude, when I pulled up to that trailhead, mm-hmm. it was like a Walmart parking lot. Yes. I saw your guys' rigs, but there was rigs everywhere. When we pulled up, we saw it, and we're like, well, this isn't going to work. We need to go somewhere else. <laughs> it was busy. We, we thought this, this place is just bombarded. This is going to be a terrible hunt. And you go down the trail – and you get off the trail and you start going up the freaking mountainside like you guys were doing two thousand foot climbs. You had to place yourself. We didn't. Nobody's see, up there, Mark. We didn't see a single soul on the trail. Dude, itself. there was dudes everywhere. There was like forty drugs at the trail. That's an exaggeration. dogs. They were running dogs. But there was there was so many people there, and then we had the whole trail to ourselves. But okay, so, so think about what you did. You hiked in on a trail, mm-hmm. and it got pretty sketch from what you said because you even guys were even telling me that. We might not be able to get the llamas back in some of these areas yeah, because it was pretty sketch. But you didn't even – you guys never hardly even camped on that trail. You mm-hmm. rarely spent any time down there other than that was your mode of transportation. Yeah. And immediately when you guys got back there, you immediately went up either side, used your raft, whatever you did yep. to get to these places that are were not on the mainstream. Mm-hmm. And it was a game changer. You guys run into bears every day, multiple bears, sometimes two in the same dang little drainage. And what surprised me, though, is how little we had to go to get away from human pressure. That's what I'm telling you. Everyone thinks I'm going to hike five miles in and then I'm going to get five miles off the trail. Well, I mean, that's great, but I don't know that you need to start with that option. Yeah. Um, Now, when you plan your hunt plan, you might have a strategy to work towards something like that. How often have you found that when you go – Three miles in, you run into fewer people than when you go five or seven miles in. Well, that's in. the other thing I wanted. I'm glad you brought that up. So guys like you and Ryan. We've ruined hunting. Are, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were just talking about this earlier. Um, you guys have made backcountry hunting sexy. And so everyone thinks they got to be 100 miles in. Dude, I am running into dudes with my llamas yeah. that have no business being well, back People there. are cussing me out left and right and Ryan. But and- I'm talking about I'm running into dudes that are overweight. And I'm not saying I'm not, you know, I couldn't be in better shape from time to time. But I'm running into dudes that have no business where they're at. No business. Yeah. They are struggling. They can barely get their body weight back there. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you going to do when you kill an elk back here? Yeah. Well, we haven't really worked that out yet. I'm like. (laughs) Right. Dude, we're going to go call some friends that have horses. I'm really? During hunting season, you're just going to call up an outfitter and he's just going to come in here and pick up your elk? (laughs) I, maybe, but in most cases, I wouldn't plan on that. But what I'm saying is a lot of guys are yeah. going a little further. So when I talk about zones of pressure and look at these canyons, guys, don't get too caught up in it. Yeah. Remember, it's one odds multiplier. It's not the odds multiplier. Yeah. So like you guys have separated yourself from guys with these alpaca rafts. Mm-hmm. Just that alone has separated you from 80% of the, and you could be more, I think you could be within, you could see the trailhead yep. and separate yourself from hunters with those rafts. There's dudes that see an animal over there, but they have no way to get it if That's they right. shoot it. Right. Well, and they don't have the will. Let's just be honest. I looked at that bear hunt and I'm like, I'm almost glad I went on the Montana one. Even, <laughs> even though it was further, you guys were on one side, 2000 feet up. <laughs> I could see the river down there, glass in the other side, dropping down, loading up those stinking rafts, risking your life across the water, climbing back up 2,000 with your camp, camping on that side. And then the next day, look back across, oh, let's go back down and go. That's a separator right there. There's yeah. Guys just aren't willing to do that. So, And I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying think about those kind of things yeah. that you can implement into your strategy where maybe distance, if you're a little more physically challenged, then let's look at some other options. Like Guys, a like here's, another, the river. here's the thing. Another tip of the seven, of the 10 here. I know we're going to move on to another one. Guys, look for trailheads that have descending terrain. Look for spots. What's that you, mean? What I mean by like a dead-end road or a takeoff spot or whatever, where you have to go downhill to the elk hunting area. Why? Okay. Guys do not like packing elk uphill. Oh, yeah, yeah, They yeah. do not. They will do anything they can. To not kill an elk downhill. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I know. Right? And I see I, what you mean. You see what? So you don't have to go as far when you go downhill. Now it's not going to be fun. Yeah. But guys, packing elk isn't fun anyway. No, no, so, no. no. <laughs> like where where we killed, where I've hunted elk the last couple of years, 
uh, you the only way to hunt that spot is to go down into Just a to hole, descend into it, kill it, and pack it all the way up a mountain. Absolutely, nobody's there. That's right. I had it all to myself. So keep that in mind too. Is that um, I I do really get excited about places when I can find them when they're downhill from the takeoff spots. Yeah. Um, whatever those takeoff spots might yeah. be. No, dudes are like, I ain't doing that. Yeah, they just they just won't do it. They, and now the ones that do, fine. You know, I don't worry about a few hunters, guys, especially archery season. Guys, let, let's just be honest here. If you're a new elk hunter and you go to an area and there's no hunters at all, I'd be concerned. <laughs> yeah. In today's world, when you go to an area and you got the whole thing to yourself, there ain't a truck at the trail. There, <laughs> there ain't a truck at the trailhead. There ain't nothing. And you're like, and this, yeah, you know, I'd be like, okay, Maybe. there's a reason there's nobody here. I'm not saying that all the time. I'm just yeah. saying, don't get too stressed about hunters. Just get smarter, get a strategy, work your plan, evaluate these features we're talking about here. Um, and you'll be surprised what will start to develop. Well, I found just like our bear series there, any area that's vertical, nobody wants to go to. That's right. I mean, my best elk and my best bear, my best everything is where it's straight up and down. Really, Mark, people, guys take one look at that and they say, no, I'm not going to do it. That weeds out nine out of 10 or more of our competition. Back to what we were saying, though, earlier about distance from the trailhead to the hunting area. Because we're running into people 10 miles back, more people 10 miles back than we are three miles back. We're looking at routes and hunting spots on our way in mm -hmm. that we're going to check out first. You saw it. We were going to. Well, next, you, well you, if we you, go back to that same spot that we went this, mm -hmm. this year. Yep. We've identified a few drainages. I yep. mean, Ryan thinks we got to be 100 freaking miles back there. <laughs> We can't hunt unless we're a hundred right, miles right. in the truck. So we were just hiking by all these freaking beautiful. I'm like, look at that good looking. <laughs> oh, don't look over there, Mark. We're going keep keep your head yeah, straight. Yeah. And um, so, but but you but but like for instance, where we were before we met up with you, we actually would go in and go. Okay, this is our first plan right here. If there's nobody there, then then. We should check this out. And then this is our second one. This is our third and this is our fourth. And we have all these little spots as we move out there because we don't want to bypass awesome areas with That's no right. pressure. That's right. And it only takes a little bit of time to take a peek at them. That's right. And we find our glassing points. One yeah. thing that I, with you, we were at your house and you were showing us on Google Earth where you can put that little thing in where it can show you where you, you, you can find your glassing point before you get there. That's right. Testing glassing spots. I have a whole module dedicated to only because man i thought everybody knew this stuff i when i first started <laughs> i thought that people knew that that was the power of google earth is that remember google earth was built not for hunters guys it was built for other things yeah. like putting in cell towers uh, putting in buildings analyzing cityscapes so view is a really important part of google earth the 3D, the mm -hmm. analyzing what you can see from certain spots, how many feet off the ground. These are all things that exist in Google Earth that most hunters are not using. Right. But they are absolutely gold for mm -hmm. hunters. Mm -hmm. They they were designed for cell, cell tower placement. When I did my research and figured out why these functions exist, they're for views from buildings. If, the, if we build a building right here, mm -hmm. what are we going to be able to see? Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, who cares about that? What I want to know is how many elk can I see from if the top of the this ridge, little ridge A? Yeah. So using those tools that were designed for other things, and that's most of what- Not only have we figured out where, where our pit stops are, but our glassing vantage points, we can hike right to them. And, you know, Ryan, I talked to Ryan about this too, and you know this too, guys. We're getting kind of off here. This is good stuff, though. Finding a glassing spot is one thing, but knowing how long it's going to take you to get there- Mm -hmm. and knowing what time in the morning you need to leave and what now bear hunting is not as important. I get it. But like for elk guys, you need to be there at freaking first light and you need to stay till last light. So having that route planned, you know, a lot of guys drop pins for glassing spots without any regard to how they're going to get there. Right. No logistic time. And then they start hiking in. They're like, okay, I'm gonna go up there. 
Guys, it's so easy. When you're on Google Earth, you can look at all the openings. You can draw your route. You can, oh, there's some rock slides. Let's, let's go around that rock slide. And then when you get there, you got this great route right to the glass. You can follow it. And then what's even better, when it's dark, you can follow it right back. But if you don't have that worked out, you're just kind of blindly navigating or you're trying to use the less resolution yeah. aerial photo on your hunt, which yeah. is not as good. Or you get there an hour after the deer. Or you get there, and they just moved gone. in the timber, and you think there's no elk here, mm. and they just moved in. You got to map that all out so you know when you got to get out of bed, when you need to get up there, and all the, that kind of stuff. And these are things that you guys already do in your head. This mm-hmm. is why with Ryan, I talk about this all the time. With Ryan, is like, he's like, man, I don't really do a lot of East Coast. I'm like, you do. You don't even realize it. When you pull open your computer, you, all these things are rolling through your head already. Mm-hmm. You're like, that glassing spot, I see the steepness. I know how long. I already, he's already subconsciously yeah. knows what he's going to do for that glassing spot. Yeah. But a person that hasn't been elk hunting for 30 years, they need, they need to understand that a little more I, specifically. I agree. Does that make sense? Yeah. I've learned a lot from Ryan because he doesn't know what I, he takes for granted so much information. That's right. That when I'm asking him, well, why did you do this? And he's like, well, it's just what you do. This is this is why. <laughs> I mean, don't you do that? You know, like yeah. no, I don't. I it never dawned on me, but now you say it. That's a new tool in my arsenal now. So I absolutely, I absolutely. Well, so I know we're talking about canyons, creeks, and drainages, and we probably okay. we're going to wrap this one up. Yeah, probably, we should right? wrap it. Yeah, because yeah. we're trying to do a short segment. <laughs> One of the last tips I'll give you on the canyon creeks and drains that I cover is evaluating not only the canyon and the directional and the trails and um, the steepness. We haven't even talked about that, but I, I want to look at it, you know, that 15 to 20 degree, 22 degree slopes. Elk love those ranges. So I want to look at the slope percentages and we go over how to do that um, using different tools. Um, but one of the things I also look for mm-hmm. is I look for drainages that do not have the V bottom. Like with bears, V bottom drainages don't matter Mm -hmm. because they're up on the slopes feeding um, and they're looking for the green patches that are being exposed to the sun. They're not as important. They're not as critical. But with elk, what I find is the one that the, the canines have a little more relaxed bottoms. So when you're looking at, I know this is kind of rude, you know, elementary, but when you're looking at a topography map and you see the V and it looks like a V, Mm-hmm. That means that canyon is really steep bottom, yeah. which means it's going to lose elevation quick, which means there's not going to hold much moisture. Yeah. Okay. What I'm looking for is when that V comes down and then it flattens out and then it goes back up. Yeah. Uh, it, guys, it doesn't take Or much. if there's some pretty darn good benches toward the bottom. That's right. Or... Anything in the bottom that can hold moisture, guys, yeah. will hold feed. So I like to find, you know, the perfect drainage for me has got a northern exposure somewhere. It's got benches three quarters of the way up. It's got saddle access on the sides, a couple of different places. It's got a more relaxed bottom, and it's got these interspersed meadows or small openings on the way up the bottom. Because what that's telling me right there is that there's a wide variety of vegetation in the bottom of that drainage because mm-hmm. anywhere there's openings in the bottom of these drainages is going to mean buck brush. It's going to mean woody plants. It's going to mean forbs. It's going to mean yeah. some grass. So that's just one more of the 10, you know, we didn't cover them all. Um, um, but I did want to point that out that I like to find these canyons that have a little more relaxed bottoms so that they'll hold moisture and they seem to be magnets for elk. What about, do you have a wolf module? No, no. Because wolf. damn, Mark. Well, like we need to study wolves, where you guys were, and then we need to start applying. The wolves change everything. Like, all of this stuff. All of a sudden, where I wouldn't see elk on a bench, I'll see him on a steep well, honestly, face. Because I, they got to, they're stiff. They move because those wolves, especially where it's just dense with wolves, you know. Um, and I think that's why they're starting to hang out on steeper slopes. Yeah. Guys, I mean, I've been looking at a lot of research and elk prefer slopes up to about 40 degrees. And after 40 gets a little, you know, they're according to an Idaho study that I read, they become less likely to hang out. That doesn't mean they won't. Yeah. They just don't like it. But where they used to spend time, maybe in that 12 to 15 degrees used to be maybe the preferred years ago. 
the more wolf pressure, the more people pressure, the more bear pressure, all of a sudden you're starting to see these elk in this 20 to 25 degrees, yep. more and more and more. So guys, using slope analysis like Cal Topo, like um, Go Hunt's got some some slope stuff. Guy has got some slope stuff. You know, right now Onyx does not have it. That's why, and I'm not dissing Onyx, but that's one of the reasons I have multiple tools. I like to look at a drainage and turn on the slope layer and say, show me everything that's 20, um, mm. 20%. Mm. Does that mean that's anything? powerful. No, but it tells me, whoa, look at all, excuse me. I'm like, look at all this green. Look at all the shaded 20 degrees. Because yeah. I know that 20 degree for me is the magic degree. Yeah. Um, of all the research studies I've read, 20 degrees is elk just love 20 degree slopes. And when I can see a whole basin wrapped in 20 degrees, it's got a north face to it. It's got a V bottom. It's got a few. I start, whoa. <laughs> I start seeing it. You know, yeah. Now, am I looking at it only because it's 20 degrees? No. No, 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 no. You, you guys see what I'm saying, right? You're, putting, you're putting a foundation. You're putting together the odds multipliers. And the more you can stack, yep. I feel like the better your odds. Well, folks, um, next module we're going to cover is what? Fires and logging areas. Wow. So that's going to be good. Um, uh, check out Treeline Academy. If you like what you're hearing and you want to check that out, use the code gritty. You're going to save on the course. And, um, if you just want to learn more, you know, you don't want to jump in with, uh, with the course, you've got all the podcasts, you've got all the podcasts that are all available at treeline, treelinepursuits.com. I've got them in chronological order. And every time I'm invited on another one, add um, it to I, the list. I add it to the list. So you don't have to search for them. You know, yeah. they're all right there. That's pretty cool. So, all right. Thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.